Our next session is titled, What We've Learned from Working with AI Scale-Ups. Now clearly, I'm not the we in this scenario, but hey, I'm always learning alongside you all. Please join me in welcoming Lonnie Jaffe of Insight Partners to the stage. Hello. Um, good afternoon. I'm Lonnie Jaffe. I'm one of the managing directors at Insight Partners. So I joined Insight about six and a half years ago. I used to be CEO of an Insight portfolio company that was called Precisely at the, uh, at Syncsort at the time, now called Precisely. And at, at Insight, I've worked on a number of our deeper tech AI infrastructure investments, like Run AI, which is sort of like uh, VMware for graphics processing units, so it can dramatically decrease the amount of GPUs you utilize on a large GPU cluster, so you can install it and it'll lower the amount of GPUs you might need by up to 80%, um, Desi AI, and a number of applied AI infrastructure investments. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we've been seeing over what was a pretty wild year in AI since our last conference from an investor perspective. So starting with the launch of ChatGPT in kind of November, December of last year, we started to see a significant uptick in fundraising and certain types of innovation. Um, one way we've been thinking about what AI is, this is uh, kind of a non-traditional uh, way of thinking about it, is that in the old days, uh, like when uh, uh, Sengsort was founded, which is 1968, um, the way software was written is that humans would show up at work and they would type on keyboards with their fingers. And that's, that's how we got the software. And then starting uh, a couple decades ago, there were some interesting uh, accomplishments in machine learning. And then around 2012 or so, uh, the release of AlexNet, which was a convolutional neural network that could do image classification, was a big catalyst here. You started to see machines writing some of the software. And people didn't use phrases like machines writing software. They would say things like, machine learning models are being trained. But what would happen is data would go into the machine and software would come out. And then that software could do things like uh, fraud detection and image classification. Uh, I have a portfolio company, Iterative Health, that can diagnose cancerous polyps from a colonoscopy video. Um, and sometimes that software was something that a human would not have been able to write software to do. Um, that is to say, it was too complex, right? And uh, essentially, the software could, the resulting software could also do things that humans would not be able to do. Then in 2017, there were a couple of interesting scientific breakthroughs. This, was, this is a non-exhaustive list of them, but one important one was in April of 2017, when a team at OpenAI uh, was working on trying to predict the next character in a block of text. And they were feeding, it was an unsupervised system where they were feeding a neural network, in this case it was an LTSM, with a large amount of uh, large, basically Amazon customer reviews. And they were trying to get it to predict the next character. And then they noticed that one of the neurons in this neural network, as an emergent property, so they had not asked it to do this or expected it to do this, had become a state-of-the-art sentiment classifier. So sentiment classifier in this context was just, it could predict whether the sentence was positive or negative toned. And state of the art meaning it was as good as the sentiment classifiers that people had been trying to create intentionally using more traditional machine learning techniques. And they were like, whoa, this is pretty amazing. What would happen if we scaled this up? If we added more graphics processing units? They had been talking with the team at NVIDIA. What if we, uh, what if we had more data? If we added all the data from the internet? Um, but unfortunately, they couldn't because the architecture they were using, the LTSM, was not very scalable. So they had to wait. Um, but they only waited about 60 days. And then a team at Google uh, Research, which we will actually, I think, hear about in our next presentation, um, uh, or at least the, the team that worked on this will, will be on, uh, published a paper called Attention is All You Need, uh, which laid out this new neural network architecture called the Transformer. And the Transformer was much more scalable. And the team at OpenAI read this paper, and they were like, this is it. This is the thing. And they refactored the system. They added a lot more GPUs. They added an enormous amount of additional data. And lo and behold, we have GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-4. We have a system that can write uh, a poem in the style of Gilgamesh about the Insight Partners Scale Up AI event and have it rhyme, and certainly have it be better than anything I could write. Um, and while technically these systems were still doing prediction of a sense, right? they're predicting the next token, you know, the next part of a word, 
it's fundamentally different in any way that we would normally use the word. And so I've been thinking about these as systems of creation to distinguish them from the prior era, the 2012 era uh, prediction and classifications and recommendation systems. And in, they can write code, they can draft blog posts, they can generate images. Just a show of hands, does anybody here have access to the image prompting from ChatGPT yet? And what about Dolly 3 image generation? Yeah, okay, so there's new stuff coming online almost every day. Um, and you know, what is this doing to the macro economy? Well, one thing that it's doing is it's significantly decreasing the price of a huge number of things that go on in the economy, uh, the cost and the price. And it's not the first time that's happened, right? The general economy is used to something like two to 9% inflation, but the, uh, the technology industry, that's not how things typically work, right? Hard drive prices drop from something like $500,000 a terabyte in 1982 to something like two or three cents a terabyte today. Uh, we're used to relentless price declines. And when prices go down, there are some things that get disrupted or commoditized, you know, things that people, economists refer to as economic substitutes. And then there are some things that actually become significantly more valuable when the price of something declines. This is what economists call economic complements. An example might be um, an electric car has a battery, and when the battery goes down in cost and can go a longer distance for a given price, the electric car doesn't become less valuable, it actually becomes more valuable, right? All of a sudden, you can, it becomes a viable consumer product and you can travel longer distances. Um, and so uh, one, one way to think about how this is, you know, so th there's a huge number of industries that got hit right out of the gate, right? Like if you were a teacher and all of a sudden your students were going home and using ChatGPT to write essays, you could close your eyes and wish it didn't exist, but it was still gonna exist. Um, and there's a lot of other industries that are having these kind of obvious first order effects. But if you take a company, like let's imagine a hypothetical company where 60% of the work today is first drafts being written by junior and mid-level people for senior people to then review and do judgment on and then uh, submit to clients or whatever the thing might be. You know, what happens if all of a sudden something like GPT-4 or GPT-4.5 can do the work of those junior and mid-level people, just the first draft, right? It's not doing a final product, but it's just producing the first draft faster, better, and cheaper. What does the firm do? Does it cut 60% of its employees and suddenly become 60% higher gross margin? Maybe. Um, what if other firms also have that idea in the same industry? Do they all do that? And do they all lower their price by 60%? And in which case, does the entire industry, that sector, does it go down in total adjustable market by 60%? Maybe. Um, in the software industry, when we see price declines, we will significantly um, expand the market in a lot of sectors. You saw this with many generations of software product where the prices would go down by 90% and the market would expand by 10x, so 100x on a per price basis. And economists call this elasticity of demand being very high. Um, there's other areas where you might see very low elasticity of demand. Uh, for example, I don't know, the corporate logo redesign sector, right? If you suddenly, it only costs five cents to redesign a corporate logo instead of $15,000, you may not see huge numbers of multinational corporations rushing out to get their logo redesigned, right? Because there's maybe fixed demand for something like that. And we've been going industry by industry and sort of unpacking some of these second and third order effects because the stakes are extremely high, right? If you just imagine a 5% EBITDA improvement on the S&P 500 and you put a relatively low 12X EBITDA multiple on that, you're talking about trillions of dollars of value that different types of companies will try to capture in various ways. There's two big shifts that I want to talk about that I think will be intuitive to anyone who's following the space, but it's worth calling them out explicitly. And the first one is, um, if anyone saw my talk last year, it's up on YouTube if you haven't, um, we have this three-layer framework, uh, infrastructure being the first layer, AI applications being the second layer, and then the third layer is a little bit more complicated, I won't get into it here. But the um, one effect of the power of the foundation models that are being provided over the internet is, is that an enormous amount of capability has moved from the application layer into the infrastructure layer and can be consumed as a service for relatively low cost, even though it's higher cost than other types of infrastructure. So for $50, you can get enough GPT-4 tokens as it would take a human to read in two weeks or so. Um, if you have $50 on GPT-3.5 turbo tokens, it'll get you enough tokens as it would take a human to read in a year. Um, and it can do things like there was a study in JAMA where they found that uh, expert human physicians ranked GPT-4 as both more empathic and more accurate 
than other expert human physicians in a study. Um, it can do things out of the box with zero shot learning or very lightweight fine tuning or retrieval augmented generation that um, are extremely application-like with um, very little work. So we have a, a program called Inside Ignite where we maintain relationships with key buyers and we're talking to a lot of large multinational corporations. Even some of the companies that you wouldn't think of as like tech companies or software companies have been able to build and deploy products already this year into production that are very meaty and substantive with relatively small and sometimes fairly non-technical teams. The second big shift, which is maybe even more important, is just how much easier this technology is to incorporate into businesses than certainly any recent major technology shift that I can think of, um, but maybe ever. Um, and you see this in the relentless release of products that we've seen from large existing software companies this year. But the impact of this on startups, like if you're a startup that's trying to, say, disrupt Adobe Photoshop, and your idea is that you're gonna have a, a software product that's not Photoshop, but it's like a photo editor, and it will generate photos instead of just allowing you to edit photos. And then Photoshop releases generative fill, which we heard about earlier, and that thing not only allows you to uh, edit photos and generate them, but also knows how to use Photoshop, right? It can use the tool, and it's lit up to the entire existing Adobe customer base, and it leverages their data asset of large amounts of uh, images that they already own the copyright to, and they indemnify the customers against copyright infringement and things like that. Um, it's gonna be a little tough for the startup if it doesn't have access to the tool. Um, and you see this with, you know, you'll, you'll, I'm sure we'll see this with PowerPoint Copilot and Excel Copilot and others. And the way I've been thinking about this is there's a knob, and the knob is typically set to startup for most big technology shifts. It's a balance of power knob. And that knob has been turned towards the incumbents significantly. Um, this is so far this year, we're only a few months into it. But this is just an empirical point about what's been happening. Um, we've already seen startups get founded, funded, and then disrupted, you know, over the course of this calendar year. Um, you know, by incumbents releasing features. So that's a very big shift, certainly from an investor perspective, but has a lot of other implications as well. Um, there are interesting moats that have started to show up, and probably one of the more significant ones is that kind of distribution and existing tool advantage that incumbents can have. And when I say incumbents, you know, our portfolio companies are typically incumbents in this tax taxonomy, our existing companies. You know, they don't have to be that big to have an amazing product with great craftsmanship that has the ability to do inference really efficiently. You know, they certainly have investors like us with the permission to invest over long-term time horizons. They can already be enjoying some basic platform scale effects. They tend to have strong talent. Um, and you know, they can curate trust in a way that, you know, sort of like what you see with Apple and privacy or Disney and children-friendly entertainment. Um, you know, the, the brands are not perfect, but they can be, they, you can build a reputation in this market, especially is very important because people are anxious about AI in many ways for very good reasons. Um, if you can build a reputation for building reliable products that are beautiful, that customers will love, that can be an advantage and the foundation models can learn how to use these products and vice versa, the, the products can learn to use the models. There is one class of startup that, um, that can be kind of interesting as a thread to pull on. Uh, this is what Kevin Scott from Microsoft has been calling instead of making the hard easy, which is what a lot of generative AI systems do, instead making the impossible possible, but still hard. And you know, th these can be interesting startup areas because, because it was impossible before, there may not be an incumbent. And because it's still hard, um, there can be a technical moat that you can enjoy for a couple years as you transition into something that's more durable as a source of uh, uh, differentiated advantage, for example, like platform effects or network effects or some sort of data scale effect. Um, our portfolio company, Profluent, is probably a good example here, which is using chat GPT-like language model capabilities to do protein design. Um, there's a lot of really significant challenges around generative AI that we're seeing. A couple of points I'll make about this, though, just before I get into them. One is that challenges often represent startup opportunities, so we keep an eye on that. You know, certainly things like privacy and, um, and explainability have been that within our portfolio, even with classical AI systems. Another is that some of these challenges are proving to be much less durable than people think. So earlier this year, there was a lot of concern around language models not being able to do math or people not being able to use these systems if they have sensitive corporate data because I can't share my sensitive corporate data with a San Francisco-based startup. 
And you know, by May, a lot of those problems were not totally solved, but significantly mitigated. Right? You could get a private Azure instance with GPT-4 that was HIPAA compliant, um, and you saw large hospital networks using them for patient diagnostic use cases. Um, even though it's sensitive data, the prompts were kept encrypted, the responses were kept encrypted. You could do fine tuning in your own instance. Um, you, know, you saw uh, the release of Wolfram Alpha and uh, Code Interpreter and the ability to write Python code come out from these foundation models. And they, they can basically do math now, um, even though that seemed like it wasn't well suited to their architecture. That said, there are some durable challenges that have persisted for much of the year. Hallucination, which can be useful for some use cases, right? Like if you're writing a villain in a play and you're looking for some help with that, um, is not useful for a lot of business use cases. Um, and so um, one way people are dealing with that problem is they're snapping these systems into business workflows. And this is pretty, a pretty common workflow where a junior person is producing a first draft of something for a senior person today. And the model is either helping or replacing the junior person. So that's one mitigation technique is you have humans review the work, the kind of co-pilot model. Um, but there's a lot of interesting startup work going on here, a lot of interesting um, science work going on as well. Um, alignment continues to be a major source of anxiety um, on many different levels, short-term and long-term concerns. And you know, there's also a whole series of potential types of cyber attacks that can be, uh, I'll call it, upgraded using language models, right? You know, something like ransomware, if you picture the language model version of that, it could be potentially a lot more severe. There's a lot of open legal questions that our portfolio companies have been looking for guidance from us around. So these are things like, you know, what is considered fair use in terms of IP used to train models or fine tune them? If you produce code, let's say, with a language model, a lot of our companies are software companies. Um, typically, software is automatically copyrighted if it's written by a human. How much human work needs to go into it? 0% probably doesn't work. If it's 10%, is that enough? What about 50%? Right? How much does the human need to do for it to now be covered by copyright? on top of what's generated by the language model. Um, law is a little bit like unreliable software that runs on unreliable hardware. So this is one of those things that nobody knows the answer to for sure. Um, and a lot of other interesting uh, challenges. And uh, I'll just say that one of the things that I've been surprised about when it comes to the challenges is how much our existing companies have been able to uh, work around them with various tactical approaches and release products into production, even though their first hackathon and their first brainstorming session about like what the products might do just happened in February or March of this year. And so that's sort of a testament to my point earlier about how much easier this stuff is to leverage. And um, some, of the, some of the products are amazing. And we're actually seeing people monetize these products in ways that are surprisingly effective the old fashioned way by charging for them. Um, which is, you know, you see this with GitHub uh, Copilot, where they're able to uh, charge multiples of the underlying product. And if people get value from it, you know, it seems more than worth this $60 a month or whatever it ends, ends up being. And then um, I would just also flag that there is an enormous amount of progress that's been happening in non-generative AI this year that's been kind of like under the radar because of how much uh, attention has been given to the generative AI. One area is computer vision and healthcare, where we have multiple portfolio companies that are approaching human level performance in computer vision tasks. And when you pass human performance in a healthcare computer vision task, it's no longer a small efficiency improvement. It's like a phase change, like ice turning to water. Um, so, and you're seeing this uh, interesting progress in robotics and a number of er other areas. And then I'll wrap up with just a point around how the, um, there are people who will have really strong opinions on the topic of something like, will large models that are proprietary versus small models that are maybe open source that you can fine tune more easily and um, you know, that will have cognitive abilities that will catch up and while they will never be able to memorize as many facts because they don't have as many parameters, you, know, you don't want to memorize facts and parameters anyway. Um, but the answer is people mostly don't know the answer to these questions and many others. Uh, these are known unknowns um, and that's okay. It's almost as useful to know what things we don't know the answer to as the things that we do. And um, we're all going to be on this journey together over the next few months. I think it's going to continue to be a pretty wild time. And um, thank you for, uh, for joining the conference to help us all learn about this together. What an insightful